Hey everyone, how's it going? Today, I brought you two eerie stories about dolls. Pretty and cute dolls always have a special charm. If possible, please avoid casually provoking them. The Porcelain Doll Let me start off by saying I'm not crazy, or at least I don't think I am. I suppose I'll leave it up to you. I couldn't tell you if I'm dealing with a ghost, a demon, or something else beyond my grasp. Any light you could shed on the subject would be great. My story starts out innocently enough. Two months ago, I was in Walmart. When I saw a life-size doll that looked just like my daughter, Abby. Again, Walmart. Not at an estate sale, not in an abandoned building, and not even some creepy, one-off clearance item without a box or price tag. There were dozens of them. I'll even add the link to the doll at the end if I remember. Anyway, I texted my wife a picture of the doll, and she admitted they looked similar, so I bought it on a whim. When I first showed Abby the doll, I asked her who it looked like. It's baby Shrek. She squealed, clearly not on the same page as me. Don't you think it looks just like you? It could be your twin sister. I asked feeling foolish, hoping to convince her to side with me. Twin sister, twin sister, she yells, grabbing the doll and dancing around the room. I take Abby out for ice cream and ask if she wants to bring her sister along. Yes, daddy. What's my sister's name? I'm not very quick-witted, so I'm surprised when I instantly blurt out, Tabitha. Tabby, she says with delight. She's smart for a three-year-old, but struggles with bigger words. Actually, Abby and Tabby would be perfect names for twins. Twin names always have that corny and awkward ring to them like my twin friends Donnie and Danny. A couple days later, Abby and Tabby were inseparable. Abby has never had an imaginary friend, so I was surprised to see her get so attached to Tabitha. We live in a small town, and so far the only neighborhood kid even close to her age is seven, and he's a brat. So I'm happy to see her bonding with someone until she starts preschool. I start to play along and begin to share my daughter's enthusiasm for Tabby. Talking and playing with her just like I would my actual daughter. My wife tells me she needs to take Abby to finish her immunizations. She knows I won't go because she's stronger than me. I can't bear to see my baby girl cry when they poke her with a needle. I load Abby in the car seat and kiss her forehead. Sit here, sweetie, while I go get Tabby. Tabby doesn't need her shots, Daddy. She's a doll. Abby says. Surprised at her change in perception about her sister. I ask. Don't you want her to keep you company? No, Daddy, you take care of her while I go to the doctor. The car pulls away and I wave goodbye and blow kisses as I always do. As soon as they're around the corner, I sprint up to the attic. I have a mini fridge up there to keep my beer out of Abby's hands. I couldn't remember the last time I had a cold beer to myself and with a couple hours to spare. I might as well take some me time. I crack one open and bring the rest of the six-pack downstairs. 
I haven't seen adult TV shows in so long, I've forgotten how to swear effectively. Always Sunny in Philadelphia is on, and I'm in the zone. I'm only a few minutes in, when I feel the stare. There's Tabitha on the other end of the couch, looking right at me. As a rational man, I try to shrug it off and laugh. The show is rubbing off on me already, and I can't stop giggling. Time for a pee break. My bathroom is on the other side of the room, so I freeze when I emerge to Tabitha once again looking directly into my eyes. Spooked, I move all around my living room trying to escape her icy, lifeless stare. This doll is like the fucking Mona Lisa, and I'm not about to let it ruin my daddy time. I man up and toss it into Abby's room. Although still weirded out, I enjoy a few more episodes of Always Sunny and polish off the beers. It'll take a lot more than a creepy doll to keep me from enjoying these precious few moments alone. Two days later, I had entirely forgotten the whole thing. Abby, Tabby, and I were back to our usual selves playing tea party, writing postcards to grandma, and living the American dream. We plan a picnic together and head out to the backyard to feast. Abby and Tabby nibble on their snacks while I lay back in the hammock. I hear whispering and look over to see what they're up to. The first thing I see are those fucking doll eyes. Her head is twisted around behind her and she's looking directly at me while Abigail is sitting on the opposite side of her. What did you do to Tabby's neck, sweetie? I stammer. My daughter looks at me with that same cold stare. She's looking at you because she doesn't like you, Daddy, she says. Oh, no. It gets worse. It gets so much worse. Three weeks go by and that doll always seems to be somewhere she shouldn't be. Every time I wake up, Tabitha's eyes are the first thing I see. No matter who is in the room, her eyes are always focused on me. I'm not about to admit to anyone what is going on, so after two sleepless nights I'm relieved to have to go out of town on a work trip. I hit Sacramento and call my wife from my room's phone to let her know I made it there safely. I'm halfway through telling her goodnight as I'm sleepily opening my luggage for my pajamas. I scream when I see Tabby glaring at me. My wife is laughing as the people next door pound on the wall to get me quiet down. Abby wanted you to have company on your trip, she says. I don't have a chance to compose myself when I hear my daughter in the background begging for the phone. Daddy, did you find Tabby? I sent her with you so you guys could learn to be friends. I miss her so much, please take good care of her. My instincts are to chuck the fucking thing right then and there, but I'm a grown ass man and my daughter deserves better. I take the doll down to the parking lot and shove her into the trunk. I get back up to my room and can scarcely sleep. I finally pass out about 6 a.m. and wake up with a start, one hour later. I open my eyes, expecting to see the doll in bed next to me, but I'm alone. After a miserable continental breakfast, I pop the trunk and there she is. I'm shocked that she stayed put. But after a month of torture and a few sleepless nights, I'm at my wit's end. I decide to just buy my daughter a new toy. Hell, I'll buy her a dozen new toys to get rid of this thing. There's a dumpster at the other end of the lot and I take great joy in marching over there to end this nightmare. I open the lid and just as I'm about to drop her, 
I get that same feeling I got when I first saw the doll. This looks just like my daughter. I can't do this. I somehow finish my meetings in Northern California and decide to just tough it out and drive back home tonight. I was a psychological wreck and needed my wife and my daughter. I put Tabby in the front seat and talk to her the whole drive home. I think I see her turn her head to me out of the corner of my eye, but I choose to ignore it this time. Somehow I make it back in one piece. My daughter gives me a kiss and yanks Tabitha out of my arms. Tabby, I missed you so much. I was happy to see my daughter smile and dance around the room with Tabby. They really do look so much alike. As Abby carries her twin sister down the hall into her room for bed, the doll's head twists around and glares daggers right through me. I can't believe I fell for that, I think to myself. She conned her way out of the dumpster this morning, but this ends tomorrow. So here we are, today is the day. I haven't slept a wink last night, and my wife is taking my daughter to her sister's house for brunch. My two little girls sit hand in hand on the couch and I scoop Abigail up and carry her to the driveway. My wife rushes past and sits in the front seat. Sorry you're not feeling well. We'll see you in a few hours. She says. I hurriedly buckle Abby into her car seat and tell her that Tabby and I will be here when she gets back. I shut the door before she can protest, and I excitedly wave goodbye and blow kisses. I sprint back to the house as soon as they turn the corner. I probably took a little too much pleasure in disposing of that evil fucking doll. Even though she never actually hurt me, I knew what she was capable of, and I had to strike first. The first thing I did was pop those ghastly little eyes out. No more ghoulish stares from you. I ripped all of her hair out, shredded her clothes, and swung her into the coffee table by her feet. I couldn't believe how much better I felt. It only took 15 minutes to finish Tabby off. I put her in my neighbor's garbage can so my wife and daughter wouldn't stumble across her. I come around the corner and am surprised to see my wife pulling into the driveway. She must have forgotten something. She angrily rolls down her window and yells. And she says, what is wrong with you? Get this doll out of the car seat. And go get Abigail. I look down to my blood-soaked hands and wish I had never bought that cursed doll. The Big Furry Thing When you're a child, it's difficult to be honest about the things that scare you. Hell. Some of them are still difficult to talk about as an adult, hence why I prefer talking about my fears online instead of in person. I've been having trouble sleeping the past week due to being reminded of my scariest childhood experience, so I feel like this would be a good time to talk about it. I want to say I was nine or some adjacent age, and we were living in Nevada at the time. It started on a Sunday when we decided to visit this small museum that had just opened up in our town. There were taxidermied animals, a section dedicated to indigenous tribal artifacts such as pottery, and tanks of live trout and other similar fish. Nothing that special to an adult, but child me thought it was the coolest thing ever. 
We were looking at some models of historical trains when I excused myself to use the restroom. I did my business, and once I stepped out, I noticed something strange sitting on the bench by the restroom door that I didn't remember being there before. It appeared to be a human-sized doll, and at first, I thought it was Smokey the Bear. But the more I gazed at it, the more I had no idea what it was. It was wearing a white t-shirt that reminded me of one of my dad's football shirts, but with an image of a cow skull on the front. It was also wearing denim jeans and had a cowboy hat on its head. Its body was covered in dark orange-brown fur, and each of its arms and legs ended in bear-like paws. But what weirded me most out about the figure was its face. It reminded me of a mix between a sloth and a Furby. It had big round orange eyes like an owl's that stared straight ahead and a short rounded monkey-like muzzle that was halfway open. I could see a tongue, but no teeth. I didn't see any ears either. Curious. I reached out my hand to touch the fur on the thing's face. And that's when it suddenly swept its head in my direction. Hey kid, what do you think you're doing? The thing shouted angrily in a raspy nasally New York voice. I leapt back, letting out a few frightened yelps. For a brief period of time, I just stood there, not moving, as me and the thing exchanged eye contact. What's the matter, kid? Something both in you? It asked, blinking its big orange eyes as it stared at me. Then it did something I hoped it wouldn't do. The thing stood up and began to slowly walk in my direction. I screamed again and sprinted down the hallway back to where my family was. My parents noticed I was out of breath and on the verge of tears and asked me what was wrong. I didn't tell them about the thing on the bathroom bench. I just told them I wanted to go home and begged them to take me back to the car. Wondering what it was that had freaked me out so much, my father dragged me back to the bathroom while my mother stayed with my older sister Katie to continue looking at the train models. I screamed and demanded dad not to take me back there, struggling to escape his own before ducking behind his back so I wouldn't have to look at that thing again. There's nothing there? See? I peeked out from behind Dad and let out a massive sigh of relief when I saw the thing was gone. However, as he took me back to Mom and Katie, I continued to nervously look around just in case the thing decided to pop out of its current hiding place. The rest of the museum trip went on fine without any new incidents, though I'd be lying if I said I didn't spend the rest of the visit on edge. It wasn't until we drove away in our car that I finally felt safe. Little did I know, my problems were only just beginning. The rest of the week was awful. On Monday, I came home from school to find that dad wasn't there, and mom told me that he'd been rushed to the hospital after having a heart attack. While he had survived, he was going to stay at the hospital for the rest of the week. On Tuesday, Katie came home with her eyes red from crying. Someone had slipped a piece of paper with a threatening message written on it into her school locker. She was so frightened by the message that she pretended to be sick for the rest of the week to avoid going to school. On Wednesday, our dog Max, a one-year-old cavalier, was found dead in the driveway. 
Mom presumed he had escaped from the yard, been hit by a car, and dragged himself home before dying. As if one sudden pet death wasn't enough, on Thursday, I found Katie's kitten, Kiki, laying on a rock by the front porch, not moving. It looked like he had fallen off the porch and broken his neck on the rock. I struggled to sleep that Thursday night. I couldn't get my mind off of everything that had been happening lately. No matter how hard I pressed my head against the pillow and squeezed my eyes shut, I just couldn't drift off. Just when it looked like I was making progress on finally falling asleep, I was jolted awake by a familiar sounding voice. Hey kid, remember me? I looked around my darkened room nervously. Was it just my imagination? The hair on my arm stood up when my ears detected the sound of breathing. I glanced at the closet at the far side of the room and felt a knot form in my gut when I noticed a humanoid figure standing right across from my bed. The light switch was right by my bedside, so I flicked it on and relaxed when I saw no one there. But my relaxation was short-lived and my heart stopped when the switch suddenly flipped off on its own. Don't do that again, kid. Understand? My blood ran cold as I slowly realized where I had heard the voice prior. I stared at the figure at the end of my room and shuddered as I made out a familiar cowboy hat and round orange eyes. I pulled the blanket over my head and curled up as I heard the figure approaching my bedside, then felt a large paw touch my back. I know you're there, kid. You don't have to hide. My breath was caught in my chest. What did this thing want from me? As if reading my mind, the thing continued. Remember everything that happened this week? Your dad's heart attack? Your sister's threatening letter? The dog? The cat? That was all me. I did it all. I felt like vomiting. The thing sounded proud of its actions, as if it thought heart attacks and dead pets were a funny joke. But you'll be happy to know that's only a preview of what I can do. I can give your dad another heart attack, and I'll make sure it kills him this time. I can make you an only child, or even an orphan. It continued, its tone sounding increasingly gleeful. I finally gained the courage to speak. Leave me alone. I cried. I could feel my eyes welling up with tears. Why can't you just go away? I cried in my bed for about a minute as the thing just stood there, continuing to breathe. I could both hear and smell its breath, and it was one of the worst things I'd ever smelled in my life. Finally, the thing spoke again. Do you have any Oreos? I paused for a second. Oreos? I replied. You heard what I said, kid. Do you know what Oreos are? The thing said. I knew full well what Oreos were. We had a carton of them in the kitchen pantry, but they were specifically for school lunches, and I was worried I'd get in trouble if mom found out I'd been sneaking them during the night. Tell you what, kid, give me a few Oreos, and I'll leave your family alone forever and ever. The thing at the museum will be water under the bridge. Deal? 
deal, I said meekly. I decided getting in trouble for sneaking snacks at night would be a better option than becoming an orphan. I peeked out from under the blankets. I couldn't see the thing anywhere, but I knew it was still in my room, hiding out of sight. As quietly as I could, I slowly opened my door and tiptoed upstairs to the kitchen before peeking into the pantry. There it was, the open package of Oreos. I carefully grabbed four Oreos from the package before tiptoeing back down to my bedroom and quietly closing the door. I then placed the Oreos on the dresser by my bed before crawling back under the covers. While under the blanket, I heard a sucking sound, followed by a loud slurping, chewing, and smacking. The sounds made me uncomfortable, and I couldn't help but picture my fingers in that thing's mouth instead of Oreos. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. As soon as the sun shone in through my window, I drowsily got up and shuddered when I saw the dark Oreo crumbs on my dresser, reminding me of what had happened last night. Thankfully, things quickly began to improve that weekend. Dad came back from the hospital, Katie gained the confidence to go back to school, and we even adopted a new cat from the shelter to make up for our double pet loss. But every time my parents asked me about going back to that museum, I would do my best to politely say no. I didn't care if that thing stuck to its promise or not, I did not want to take any chances by going back to the place that started it all. It's been 15 years since then. We've moved from Nevada to Oregon, and me and Katie have our own house. Katie's been dating this guy named Colin, and I've been going to the gym every day. Things are pretty good right now. I'd completely forgotten about that frightening incident until just last weekend. We had decided to go eat at our local IHOP to celebrate Dad's birthday as a family. While there, we started talking about cryptids and paranormal stuff for whatever reason, and mom decided to tell us about something strange that happened to her when we were living in Nevada. The night after dad was rushed to the hospital, mom had gotten up in the middle of the night to get a drink of wine. While drinking, she peeked out the front window and saw some movement in the front yard. She initially thought it was a deer or some other animal, but as she looked closer, she saw what appeared to be a man dancing drunkenly through the yard. As she watched the figure dance, she noticed some strange things about him, like that he appeared to be wearing a furry costume of some kind, and could also see a pair of big round orange eyes beneath the rim of his cowboy hat. She opened the door to get a better look at the figure, only to see that he had disappeared completely, and she spent half an hour wandering the yard unable to find any trace of him. She then chalked it up to some sort of trick and completely forgot about it until now. Well, the mention of the cowboy hat combined with the big orange eyes jogged a lot of unpleasant memories that I wish I could forget, and now my childhood paranoia is starting to come back. My logical side says that thing is probably keeping its promise, and if it hasn't come back now, it's probably long gone. But I've spent the past week sleeping with the lights on, and a package of Oreos by my side just in case. <laughs>